have just made it to the Cimetière Commune de Montrouge. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that all completely wrong. It is located here, wherever here is. <laughs> See the entrance to the cemetery. Some pretty flowers out front. And then across the street here, see some businesses that offer funeral services located right across the street. I do apologize. It's windy. I don't know what's going on in France. I mean, I'm thankful for the wind, um, but I don't know why it's so windy. <laughs> Alright, so, sorry, cobweb. Maybe it's my own hair. Who knows? <laughs> Always in this video, it's a hair thing. Like, ugh. I just walked from my school, um, 45 minutes to here, uh, at this Montrouge Cemetery. Um, lucky for me, it's a Tuesday because the cemetery is only open on, let's see, Tuesdays and Saturdays. So I almost messed up. I hadn't, uh, I don't know, got lucky. They probably would have been closed. So. Here I is. Um, I still got my backpack on and my little carry bag. So we're gonna do a quick walk through and kind of see what's what. We've got all kinds of interesting stuff. We just we're not just like walking through the cemetery, look at the cemetery, but we're looking at kinds of things. I guess I should say not just the headstones or whatever. I've just been looking at the placement of the hours and stuff. It's actually quite the little um, like a I don't know, like a business section or office or something you can go in. Oops. They have a bathroom inside, which is nice because I might need one. Yeah. Alright, so I'm not going to make y'all look at my face this whole time. Um, and I'm recording this with my phone, so it may be a little bumpy. I hadn't planned to go to a cemetery today, but I had a rough day at class. Uh, I mean, <laughs> very similar to yesterday. But, here, I'm just going to sit on this bench and talk to y'all for a second. <sighs> There we go. Nice, a cemetery with a bench in it. I know some that don't have any, so that's really nice. Uh, but anyway, I had a really rough day in class today. Um, I had hoped, I mean, I get, yeah, it's only day two, but I only have until tomorrow to decide if this level's gonna work for me. Um, I tested into this class online, um, A2, it's like a upper beginner level, supposedly beginner, right? But um, I don't know. It's, it's difficult. It's complicated. And <laughs> like the things the teacher is teaching, I know those things. Like I learned them last semester in my French class. But even though my teacher spoke French the whole time in America, um, it was very focused. You know, it was easy to follow, easy to understand. Even when we didn't understand, you could kind of guess what he was talking about. Um, but this teacher just jumps right on in. She doesn't make any accommodations for the different language levels in the class. Um, she just speaks French and she explains ideas and gives definitions of words in French, which is complicated because if I don't, like my vocabulary is limited, right? So if I don't understand the words you're using to define the words that I don't know. Uh, it just creates a mess, you know, um, and she doesn't write them down. She doesn't give handouts so that you can read over it later. Um, it's all just oral. So I'm sitting there listening to her talk and I, I can't take notes on that. I don't know how things are spelled. Um, I don't know 
what she's referring to a lot of the time. Sometimes I have to just look words up on my own personal dictionary, which means while I'm doing that, I'm not fully attentive to what she's talking about, and it's easy to fall behind. <sighs> so, yeah, it was tough. I only catch about 50% of what she says, and it's probably less than that um, because I think a lot of what I understand is just sort of habit from being in a bunch of different types of language classes over my lifetime. You know, I've studied Spanish and Japanese. I've studied Chinese, um, French, and I dabbled in Korean. I wouldn't say studied, but definitely dabbled. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, you know, after going to so many language classes, you sort of recognize body language. You can pick up on intonation and things like that, that are just clues to what someone is referring to. Um, but it's just such a challenge. I can't even tell you how difficult it is. Um, so at the end of class today, I went to my teacher and just asked her if, um, if it's possible to go to the lower level. Um, the problem is that the lower level educationally is not going to be much help for me because I've already learned all the information. I wouldn't say learned either, like I am familiar with the information, um, but it's been, let's see, my class is finished in April. So about three months since I had class, two-ish, since we're just sort of starting July. Um, but that's a long time with zero French in my ears because I was doing other things during the summer um, other classes so a lot of it is stuff I need to remember you know um, stuff I need to study but I don't have any language books with me I don't have any materials you know when you pack you pack necessities of life and um, books are heavy <laughs> so um, I think I have a digital book on my computer that I'm going to start looking through today but I don't know. You know, she recommended I stay in the class at first, but she's like, you know, it's only going to get more difficult. Um, but I was telling her, you know, in my American class, we didn't speak English. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, we didn't speak French. We, guys, back it up right by me. We, um, the class was so large that we didn't all get a chance to speak, you know. Um, and then when we did, it was very directed speech. You know, we had sentence structure and then we were inputting our own thoughts and ideas into the sentence structure. Um, we had vocabulary readily available, like vocabulary we had just learned that we were now using in class. That's very different from walking into a very open setting and someone just expecting you to talk freely about any topic they bring up. Um, it's. It's just such a challenge. So I don't know. But I listened to the other students, and I think a lot of them have been living in France for a long time. So they picked up words and phrases and things you use every day, right? Daily sort of speech. But they don't know, like, the reasons behind what they say. Um, they don't understand the pronunciation sometimes or... Um, some of the small changes you work when or you make when you conjugate conjugate words and stuff like that um, it's something that I have picked up on and understood very well but I lack you know the ability to speak freely that they have it's like if you could put me and them together you might have a complete person who speaks French <laughs> uh, but I don't know um, yeah I'm not sure and so I was talking with my friend Phil, who lives in uh, Bergerac, not talking, but texting and explaining the situation and asking his advice because he's French. He knows what the education system is like. I don't. This is my first experience with it. And I don't know, he was kind of negative. He was like, you know, you didn't pay $10,000 to come to France to like give up and you knew this time was coming. Like, why didn't you prepare? Like all that kind of stuff. I'm like, that's easy to say. 
but like I have a life outside of studying um, so I don't know it's it wasn't it wasn't encouraging not that I wanted a what was me pity party but I wanted someone who could kind of understand and offer like real advice and not be so harsh um, so I was pretty disheartened after that little brief interactions it happened like right after class anyway um and i was kind of standing in the stairwell because i stopped for a minute and it was just like geez that was mean and i don't really know what i want to do you know i was hoping for some guidance some direction someone to bounce thoughts and ideas off of <coughs> but instead i kind of got put down even more um so i don't know but i stopped in the stairwell and i was just kind of upset about it i'm very sensitive for y'all that don't know um that's why a lot of times i come across as very like even kind of blah sometimes monotone that kind of thing because um inside i'm super squishy and very emotional i take things extremely personal um but I recognize that my reaction is someone else's overreaction, right? Um, and so I just try to be very, like, cover all of those feelings inside with like a blanket of calmness, <laughs> which is why you don't see me get like extremely excited or extremely sad or angry or those kind of things. I'm just kind of, I try to keep it chill. Um, which, you know, helps me too, because I can't walk around crying over every little thing that happens. Even if my heart is crying, I have to be like, you know, pushed through on the outside. Um, but anywho, I was kind of upset. And one of my classmates saw me as I was walking down the steps and um, he kind of stopped and started talking to me in French. And I was just so distraught. I was like, I'm sorry, I can't do French right now. And so he switched to English. And he was like, but I thought you understood French. And I was like, I kind of do, but like, you know, not now. It's like, you know, when you have distressing moments, when you have emergencies and things that happen, you immediately switch back to like the language you're most familiar with, right? Um, so I don't know, but he started talking with me as we walked down the three and a half flights of steps <laughs> to the ground level. Um, and he's actually, I, I can't remember his name, Robert, I think. Um, he's actually a Christian. He's studying, um, French. Uh, he actually lives in Rome and he's doing research out there. And I think he's part of the church in Rome or something like that. Um, but talking with him was really good. He offered a lot of encouragement. Um, and he was like, you know, he pointed out the advantages that English speakers have learning French over um, people like himself who, you know, French and English are not their native language. Um, and, you know, he was like, I should listen to the other people in class and hear like they're not perfect and they're struggling. And he's like, a lot of them don't even understand the teacher. And like, at least I can understand the teacher. And I was like, well, I kind of don't, but. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess we talked for about 20 minutes. And while we were talking, the teacher came downstairs and saw me and she stopped to talk to me. And of course, I couldn't understand. Like, <laughs> I pretended like I did. But I mean, she doesn't speak English, so I can't be like, oh, can you speak English for me? Um, so I just listened the best I could. I think she was saying, like, you know, she wants to know what I choose and um, she wanted to emphasize that like classes were only going to get more difficult, but that, you know, maybe the other class was definitely going to be too easy for me. Um, maybe push me to spend time speaking more and listening more. Um, she wanted me to try to complete the assignment we did in class today, which we had to choose two articles out of the local newspaper. Um, read them in French, try to understand them and restate what they were about. Um, and then we have to like come to class tomorrow and just give an update on the articles. Um, 
which is not so bad if I have time to go home and do it and think about it and all. But if I have to do it right there in class, no. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to try and do it. I'm going to try and stay in class. I don't know. Um, Robert said that he would be willing to help. Um, he's same level as me. Like, he tested into A2 also. Um, but his French is so good, and he speaks all the time. He sounds very fluent to me, um, and he speaks fluently with the teacher. But I don't know. I don't even understand half of what he says, so he's right up there with the teacher for me. Um, I don't know. He said he had, like, a book that's helped him that he'll let me use. Um, and he said he hopes that I'll stay in class, you know, that kind of thing. Just encouraging which is really what I needed in the moment. Um, and then I have to remember, you know, I don't really need the grade in this class. Um, I feel a lot of pressure to get a high GPA at school. Um, and taking this class could potentially really drop it if I fail, right? Um, so I don't know. I don't know, I feel a pressure and stress from that. Like the overachiever in me is like, I'm not gonna get an A in this class, you know, even if I put my best effort, I'm probably only gonna come out with the C. Um, and they only told us, or they already told us at the beginning that most students will probably come out with the C. <laughs> and they said they very rarely give out high scores in France. So, <sighs> I don't know. I'm still undecided. And a large part of me is like, like last night I had hours I sat at home and I was like, I don't even know where to start. Like, I don't even know how to study when there's no materials, there's nothing. Like, you, where do you start? Like, do I open a dictionary and read it? Do, I, I don't know, you know, and how do I review what I've already learned so that I don't waste time, like, you know, starting at level one somewhere. Um, I've just never been in a situation where study is completely open and there's no guidance and there's no class materials, no books, no resources, like nothing. It's just sort of here, speak French. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's super challenging. <sighs> so that's what's going on with me. Um, and, and so after all that, I was just kind of stressed. And I was like, maybe I should go to a park and just chill for a minute. And I thought, well, I'm supposed to be visiting cemeteries. I was going to wait till... Um, next week-ish to start doing cemeteries um, after I got more acclimated. It was like, you know, it might be just a good relief or release to go to a cemetery. For me, cemeteries are like awesome, relaxing places. And so, yeah, I looked at the closest cemetery I could find. It was this one. I was like, I've never heard of it. Didn't visit it last year. So let's go. <laughs> uh, and it was like a small place. So enough of me chatting. I'm going to get my face out of here and uh, turn you around so you can see what I'm seeing out here because it's beautiful. And uh, we'll focus on some cemeteries. Okay, we're here at the entrance. I was just sitting on that bench there, laying out my woes for all the world to hear. <laughs> and this is the main pathway down the cemetery. It's pretty cool looking. Uh, keep in mind, I am using my phone today. Um, and it's windy, so I do apologize. I cannot control the wind, y'all. Uh, but I'm thankful for it because I'm hot and sweaty after walking 45 minutes. Uh, oof, it was so hot earlier, but now the clouds have come in, so it's nice now. But earlier it was not nice. <laughs> it's beautiful to see all the flowers. At the entrance, they had some paperwork about the... Um, different varieties of plants out here. Apparently that's a big point at this cemetery. Look at that echinacea. You make some tea. It's so beautiful. Oh my goodness. I gotta get a picture of that with bees on it too. Uh, these flowers are something else, I tell you. Um, and that's something a lot of um, the black cemeteries in America have been focusing in on is like native plantings, um, well I shouldn't say native, like cultural plantings, the kind of things that are uh, recognized in the community as being of African origin or 
early enslavement sort of origin. These flowers are just beautiful. And this cemetery closes in how long? In about two and a half hours, so I have some time. I'm just going to take the first pathway here. I don't have any rhyme or reason for where I'm going. I'm just walking. Look how well, well cared for these pathways are. That's pretty awesome. Some of the things growing on the headstones. Well, it's not a headstone. <laughs> these are fake plantings, fake flowers. Um, these ones here, those are real. You can see they're not really that tended for. Check out how close these burials are to each other. You limit the amount of ground space. You limit the amount of overgrowth that can happen. Um, these guys are just breaking up through the caulking. You can see their... It's not caulk. I don't know what that is, but they're breaking in through that portion. Um, it's the weakest link out here, but it makes for much easier care. And I'm not seeing too many marks on here. Light markings. Let's see. So they might be using some kind of tools to, um, like weed eaters or something, but I'm not seeing the usual markings you see when people use weed eaters to get rid of stuff like that. And these are all fairly uniform for the most part. These little gifts and things people leave. But those are very sturdy. They're not things that are just going to blow away. That is hard, hard, heavy stone there. <laughs> I mean, you can see the wind is blowing everything, but those are not moving. And most of the things people leave out here seem to be quite sturdy. Something I think we could learn from in the United States. A lot of times people will bring out these flimsy things made of plastic and stuff and you leave them at a cemetery. First, plastic is not biodegradable. It's harmful to animals who do frequent cemeteries, by the way. And um, it just sort of blows around and gets turns into trash over time. And if a cemetery is already neglected and not really cared for, you're just creating a larger mess by doing that. These little things are so cool to me. I love the windows they have in them. That one's blue. Oh my. This guy needs some love. Oh, I see something really cool over there. I don't know what that is. It's got a sign by it though. I'm going to go that way. I'll check it out in a minute. But it looks like people here are very religious with their burials. Butterfly. It's a lot of crosses, angels. Huh. I wonder if I walk down, does it circle back around? Check out that cross. That is wicked. I like that. I guess I shouldn't call it cross wicked. Or should I? I don't know. <laughs> Really? Does that just say another uncle? <laughs> I think it does. Interesting. I like this sort of flame thing. This is the back of it, but I've seen things like that in America too. They're pretty neat. And check out these walls. That is a wall that you are not jumping over, my friend. Too many of the minority cemeteries have no security, no protection, no walls at all. Um, so this is awesome. This is something I see around most French cemeteries, actually. Uh, you are definitely not getting over that. And 
I don't know if you saw the gates at the beginning. Those gates are firmly secured. This ivy, which is growing, seems very controlled. It's not like an eyesore by any means, actually. It's quite beautiful. I love these like ceramic flowers and things. I don't know if it's ceramic, I'm just guessing. I'm very curious as to what this is. So I have some research to do to figure out what these things are. Maybe I'll ask my teacher who is French. She's here. I ran into her yesterday by accident. Didn't even notice her and all of the young Americans following her. Um, I noticed her after I passed about six or seven people and my brain sort of registered. Hey, you know, something happened. <laughs> you see these people, you know them. And then I think she did the same because she was like, Kelly, Kelly. <laughs> So I hung out with them for a good 10 minutes yesterday. This is interesting. They have this area blocked off. I can see that this thing is like toppled over. Oh my. Yeah. That's not good. So I'm curious as to what causes that. Interesting. say like I'm conducting research but really I'm just asking a whole bunch of questions. You see the window on here is broken out. Let's see. The thing I wanted to get to is over there. It might take the long way around. And to help me with editing I think I'm going to do shorter video clips. <laughs> These are not highly produced vehicle uh, vehicles, videos. I definitely prefer like the YouTube videos where people are just sort of real in the moment. They're not super edited. Um, sort of like reality TV. Look, they have their areas labeled. That's nice. So there's probably a map somewhere where I can find my way around. They might even have an online map. This is This. I'm not sure what that means. I don't see like a crack or anything. Be interesting to know why they would spray paint something orange. Excuse me. We've got an area for trash here and water, probably non potable water. What does it say? to show y'all something I saw over here that looks kind of cool. Look at that. I don't really want to walk over there because these are so close together. I'll zoom in. Check out the tile work. Isn't that beautiful? And his last name's Paris, too. <laughs> Funny. That one's done in blue lettering. That's something I actually don't see often, is a change in lettering outside of, like, white, gold, or nothing. Like, you've got a gold one there, and those there are gold. <laughs> you know, it's very common to see gold. Look at that. These people must really be cared for. Looks like there's at least three people buried in this one spot. And that's one interesting thing about French burials. And I am like no expert. I'm just regurgitating what I've been taught in my cemeteries class, really. Um, but a lot of times they do family burial plots. Uh, and we do a similar thing in America. But they do it a little different here. Like every, and I need to research this for more detail but like every x number of years you can actually bury someone else in the plot like you don't have to have a million feet down you know six feet for every person or three feet for every person or whatever 
um, you just wait until the first burial is fairly, I'm sorry, it sounds bad, but fairly decayed. And then you just rebury in that same spot. So you get sort of a mini catacombs <laughs> type situation happening in the ground here. Um, which for Americans, it might bother us, you know. But here, it's a common thing to do. It saves space on cemeteries. All of the family can be buried in one location, assuming you don't have, you know, major disaster and a bunch of people die at one time. Um, and it makes it so much easier on the relatives, right? I mean, how great is it to be able to come and visit all your family at one location? Of course, that also assumes that family doesn't move all over, you know. Um, but even if they did, they could still be buried here because that's the family spot. You see some of the damage to the stone. But that's a beautiful carving. Okay, I got off track and got away from where I wanted to go, so now I'm just going to cut through. I'm just trying to avoid that, but it's happening now. <laughs> Stones. I think that's pretty. Looks like these are children. It's one year, 15 months. That's all they said. But this, this is the thing that caught my attention. I hope it's okay to walk through here. Grab a photo of this. This is Hotel for Insects. Yeah. So they tell you like the different insects they have. I guess this is like the food and stuff that they eat and where they live as well. That's cool. I've got one of those in my room right now. It flew in last night on the sixth dog on the floor. Flew in. That is so, so neat. So what great way to celebrate, like, the biodiversity of the area, right? To have natural plantings of flowers everywhere. To celebrate insect life, which is something we really don't do enough in America. We are like, ew, bugs kill them. But in fact, bugs are vital to our ecosystems. Look, they even have, like, a earth kind of part down there. This is just so neat. That is amazing. I love that idea. I want to like take this idea back home. <laughs> and it's like in the shade of this nice little tree. It's very, very cool. All right, uh, I'll grab a picture of that too. Let me figure out how to get back to the main path without being super invasive here. Let's see, there's really nowhere to walk. I'm gonna go between these guys. Should be okay. Ah, there we are. So the pathway continues that way. And this way. It's getting really cloudy, y'all. I wonder if it's gonna rain on me. But well, anyway, I'll keep on going. If it rains, I'll just be a wet videographer. <laughs> my hands more still when I'm walking. I have a tendency to like bounce a lot when I walk which makes for like super bouncy videos and I do my 360s way too fast so I'm trying to slow them down. I'm like if it's hard for me when I'm editing the videos later it's got to be hard for <laughs> others who are watching. Notice how things aren't all like super bright and shiny. I mean, these things have all kinds of biological growth on them. And look at that. I know people in America that would see this and be like, oh, it's not shiny anymore. It's got a little dirt on it. You know, whatever. We need to clean it, pull out the D2. 
And like, I, I understand the thought, I understand the idea. But honestly, if the headstone is not in danger, and you know, those little biological growths, those don't endanger those, uh, these rocks and stones in any way, really. You can still read the information that's on the headstones. And all the bird poop, like rain will wash it away. You know, there's really no reason to run out and grab some cleaner and clean headstones every time you see a little dirt. A lot of people don't understand that mentality. But every time you clean a stone, you're basically taking off a layer of it. And so we want to preserve them as long as possible. And the way to do that is to only clean it when absolutely necessary. That means when the stone is in danger. Or when the words are no longer legible because they're covered with something that's difficult to remove. And so... You just want to be mindful of that. And honestly, if a cemetery has already been recorded, like documented on paper or electronically somewhere, it doesn't even matter if the words are being partially obscured because it has been documented. I get it that a lot of people won't understand that. It's like another insect house. <laughs> I get it that a lot of people won't understand that. A lot of people won't agree with it either. That is totally okay. You do not have to agree. These are my opinions. And remember, I'm also a student. While I've worked in cemeteries for a long time, I'm a student of cemeteries. What in the world kind of symbol is that? It's a lot happening. <laughs> a lot of things. I guess he was a jack of all trades. And I just assumed it was a he. Terrible. Oh, look at that. The actual picture. That's cool. But yeah, so you don't have to agree with me. That's all I'm basically saying. Um, I don't propose to be an expert. Now, this guy's got some damage to it that actually needs some attention. This is actually the kind of thing you want to fix. Um... I mean, there's still some time. I don't think, um, I don't think anything's actually buried in the stone portion, if I'm not mistaken. It's all underground. At least what I saw, I watched last year, um, somebody, or a group of somebody's on opening up a burial space. these locations it was all in the ground so these look like some freshly dug burials maybe I don't know what's going on there actually it's kind of a mess I have to say this is probably the most disrepair I've seen in one cemetery location. Not that I've visited, I mean in, in Paris, not that I've visited a ton of cemeteries. Y'all, this man is not that bad. Oh my goodness. Um, I've only visited maybe three or four cemeteries in Paris outside of this one, but, and I have seen disrepair, but it's usually certain sections and they're usually blocked off. Um, but this one just sort of has bits and pieces here and there, you know. Um, things that aren't too much a cause for concern, but are worrying. Like, for example, this. Sorry, that was my hand. This here. Um, that could cause some instability. Uh, this here, we've got some spalling or something happening. Probably some iron pins in there that are rusting out. Actually, I did think I saw some pins in the camera. So, yeah, stuff like that needs immediate attention. 
and that's not something you fix with cleaner, right? You have to have conservators or someone who knows what they're doing to come in and take care of that. That's not a volunteer job. I'm curious about this area. Which is kind of wood. I'm not going to go over there, though. I do apologize for all the wind. If it's too bad when I listen back to it, I might fill this section with uh, music and just do some subtitles on the screen. <laughs> we'll see. Big giant gates that are locked and blocking the entry, which I love to see. Back to our cobblestone walkways. I hate these things. They're so hard to walk on. <laughs> oh my. I love to see this kind of thing though. It shows that people are really cared about. Oh, like that up there. You would definitely want to address that. <laughs> There's actually lots of damage to this. Um, this cracking like right along here. That is not natural. It shouldn't be there. Not like these that are, you know, purposefully. These are created in sections that were laid here, set here. That cracking is not. Um, you've got this area here. And you can't really see it. Let's see if I can zoom in. So right there, that whole area. All of that stuff needs attention. rusting and stuff is actually not something that needs to be addressed. It's superficial. I just felt the rain drop. <laughs> it's like superficial stuff. Um, it's like they tried to paint it or whatever, but rust will rust no matter what. There are some things you can do, but ultimately it is what it is. Y'all, I'm totally going to get caught in the rain. <laughs> That's alright. If it gets too bad, I'll cut the camera and head out. There's really nowhere I can go, though. I'm just going to get wet. Hopefully it blows over quickly. We've got some beautiful, beautiful marble work happening here. Look at that. Went some damage to the glass on the door, which is sad. But that is gorgeous. Oh my gosh, all the bees. And people say, like, the bee population is dying. I think they're all right here. There's easily three, four hundred bees over here down this whole long way. And butterflies. Oh, and it smells nice, too. All right, bees, to your work. Another little house up in the tree. They really... I love this so much, how the cemetery space is just being used for so many other things. Look at that. I bet that's awesome when it's lit from the inside, stained glass. something you don't see every day. I don't know if you do in Paris, but down in America. I was just looking at this retaining wall here that's holding the second level and that's like up a couple feet, maybe two and a half, three-ish feet. Actually, that might be waist height on me. I can't tell because there's a ledge here. So that's up, I don't know, 
six, six ish inches, maybe a little bit more. So that could be a good three, four feet tall. Not four. <laughs> and uh, it is in much need of repair. That is just naturally going to happen when you have the pressure of dirt and stuff pushing against the wall like that. Um, it goes down and out. And it's just like a compression kind of thing. Um, even if they have like cement walls with like rebar in them, it's still going to have crackage. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about it. Look at that. It looks like a well. That's cool. I don't know why I zoomed in. I was trying to zoom out. <laughs> hey, the rain seems to have let up, so that's good. Wow. Look at that. Ignore the dumpster in front of it. <laughs> I'm telling you, having water available at a cemetery is so necessary. It's so necessary for the life and care of the cemetery. So many of our cemeteries in America do not have water access, do not have electrical access, anything like that. And you really do need it. It's not enough just to have an open space of ground and say, here we can, you know, place our deceased. Um, you really need to think through the needs, like future needs of a cemetery. You know, some of our older cemeteries, they wouldn't have thought about that because water, like, water being pumped and, like, <laughs> electricity and things weren't common, right? But now, oh my gosh, y'all, I do not want to drop my phone down here, but look at that. That is amazing. Oh, it's so scary, too. Could you imagine, like, <laughs> falling down that? <gasps> Gives me the heebie-jeebies just thinking about it. I like that technical term there, heebie-jeebies. Add that to your cemetery vocabulary. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful little window. It's a little dirty, but pretty. I like that color blue. stuff going through it. Here's another one, like a book. Look at that. It's gorgeous. Oh, sorry for the wind, y'all. Now there we go. More damage. That's epic damage. Yeah, so I'm just really shocked, actually. cemetery. I don't know what that means for Paris. Um, I don't know what that means in regards to funding and care. But I'm very shocked to see some of the damage that I see here. I mean, to be fair, it's probably only about 5% of what we've looked at out of all of the headstones out here. But look at this guy. This little system all to its own. Look at that. There's like little ants and things hanging in there. It's beautiful in its own way. I'm concerned when ants start coming in. Um, I have seen oh, man, this I have seen headstones that have become off-center. Like they lose their center of gravity or it shifts because ants built their homes in the joints <laughs> of the stones or in between like the two separations between like the actual stone and the base um, and when we remove the two 
it was just a bunch of ants like dirt <laughs> I don't even know how to explain it it's like they moved dirt onto the headstone so that they could have a home or whatever but yeah um, you have to be careful of that you get ants between like the actual die which is the upper part and then your base you are gonna have an issue this guy I bet has some pins in there that are rusting that's typically what you see when there's metal that's holding one part of the stone to another connecting the two parts and then there's some mortar in there that's given away I don't know if I can point it out with my finger there we go so right in there you see it's kind of a dark spot that's empty and then over here it's lighter that's the mortar so it, it needs to be those pins need to be re replaced with uh, something that's not going to rust on you and this stone can be repaired this whole thing can be repaired it's not a difficult repair you just have to be super careful because it is cracking up the middle there and I see this up at the top so I have some concerns about it um, it is possible it could be seriously damaged and you might not want to remove it but I just like extreme caution maybe <laughs> those metal pins I tell you they are the detriment of so many headstones it's insane and apparently Paris is no exception but I guess at one time you know that's what you had so that's what you used right and then as technology changes you don't think well let's go through all the cemeteries and replace the metal and all these headstones like imagine how expensive that would be and how much work that would be but the other side of that is, you know, compare it to the expense of actually, compare it to the expense of actually having to repair all of these stones after they've spalled like that. Um, the expense of hiring a conservator or a stonemason or both, you know, to come in and make repairs. Um, it might actually be cheaper <laughs> to replace all those metal pins before that happens. Uh, it's just something to think about. We can employ a lot of people in our cemeteries and have them uh, working to repair this kind of stuff. I was just drawn to this. Let's see if I can zoom out. Look at that. Is that not beautiful? Oh my. try and get it from this side too. Look at that. And this is such a peaceful, quiet place. I've seen a lot of people out here, actually. Um, and I'll say I've seen people of all nationalities or ethnicities out here just in the short time I've been here so it's kind of cool I wonder if this cemetery has another exit otherwise I'll have to walk all the way back up to the front which is not a problem since I'm getting my steps in <laughs> but it is a problem if the rain comes. This is interesting. So we always know where we are. Oh, look at that box. See it? Uh, the lighting is not great. That stinks. Get a picture of it. That was 
like a little man up there. <laughs> oh well. So strong. Got a picture of that. French is terrible, but it says something like, here's a beautiful prairie of flowers, <laughs> a field of flowers, and uh, it lists some of them, I think. I'm not familiar with them, maybe the cosmos, I'm not familiar with the others. And it says, um, you're going to love it, and should compliment, compliment, contemplate this rich biodiversity. That's my rough translation. You're welcome. <laughs> so you can see, I really need a lot of help. In fact, I probably got that all completely wrong, but that's okay. I tried. I'll look at it later try to translate it. Look how bright and vivid some of these flowers are. It's beautiful. I love this kind of arrangement where it's built in for real plantings to go. Because so many times people want to plant near a burial, but the plantings are just in the ground. And a lot of times they actually want to plant trees, which is a big no-no. I know a lot of people don't get that. If you want to plant trees, there are services for that where you can have your loved one's ashes um, kind of mixed into like compost where they will, I shouldn't say compost, like, like fertilizer, right? Um, and they'll use that to plant a new tree or something. Um, but to actually plant a tree by a headstone um, causes a lot of issues. It looks real cute and nice and maybe makes you feel great at first, but over the years, the roots from that tree can stretch several miles and uh, they can sprout new trees along the way. Um, so if someone were to like say plant a tree right here, the roots would stretch far and wide. They would affect and impact all of the burials around. I know y'all have seen those trees in the city, right, where they planted them in the sidewalk and the roots grow above ground and actually lift up the concrete and push through it and it messes up the whole sidewalk, right? That same idea applies to cemeteries. So if you plant a tree by a burial, you have to really know what you're doing. You have to plant the right kind of tree and you have to care for it and make sure it grows a certain way. And even then, you can't really predict what the roots are going to do. Um, I've heard that there are some ways that you can like limit the growth of trees so that their roots don't go very far and don't come above ground. Um, perhaps the French have mastered that because I rarely see it in their cemeteries and they have lots of trees. Um, but in America, that doesn't seem to be a thing because our cemeteries that have these trees growing are just out of control. And I'm not talking about those cemeteries that are like really cared for and nice. I'm talking about um, some of our minority cemeteries that are lacking in care. Um, and these are often the cemeteries where people want to plant things. Um, and I do understand the idea behind it. I love the idea behind it. But unfortunately, it's extremely bad for the burials. Um, and over time, um, you know, it could cause great damage to the headstone and even to the burial vault itself. Um, so that is something to consider. And the older a tree is, the <laughs> bigger and larger those roots are. And if the tree falls down, 
you know, say one of these, well, these aren't that tall actually, but even one of these, which is smaller, if it fell down, it easily affect what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight burials just right here. Um, and that's assuming the roots didn't rip up part of the ground and bring other things with it when it fell. Um, so just this little tidbits like that can help you be a good steward of your cemetery. And just remember, there are other options for burials, other options for your loved ones, and other options for you to remember them um, besides planting a tree in a cemetery. And some cemeteries have areas where you can do sort of memorial planting. So check with the, the cemetery where you're going to have someone interred and see what options they offer. It might not be things they... Um, might not be things they immediately like tell you when you first contact them. So just think about that. Alright. Another 360. <laughs> Look at that beautiful tree. Is that a mimosa tree? I think it is. It's pretty. tell y'all now I don't know anything about <laughs> plants and trees and I used to be an herbalist but that was one of the hardest things for me is recognizing plants in the wild I never really got the whole wild foraging thing I wanted to but I couldn't these are areas that they're clearly letting grow and we have stuff like that in America too for people who are environmentally conscious they have these wild grow areas where you're not allowed to cut it's supposed to grow like that <laughs> look at that how beautiful now I last year when we when my class went to a cemetery we got to see someone working on the headstones and they were actually carving in the names onto the headstone while we were there like chiseling it in with a little hammer and then he showed us like the little stuff he uses to do the gold leafing afterwards and they actually do it here on site after the headstones have been placed which is pretty cool I want to get over to this headstone but I don't know how to get over there just sort of like plants here and there. Let me see if I can find a clear walkway and a sturdy walkway so I don't want to cause any damage. We'll go through here. Yeah, that was fine. There we go. Look at this. First, this guy up here very stoic gentleman. Or maybe it's a lady. I don't know. And then this, which is cool. Actually, it's like a coin. With the dates on it. What a cool idea. I like that a lot. So neat. And it's probably like this person's likeness or whatnot. And I just want to point out I love cemetery bugs. Look at this giant snail. That is some delicious escargot right there, guys. I'm saying that. I do not eat snail, y'all. <laughs> I have not tried it since last year when I first came to Paris. Um, I don't think I'll try it this year either. I almost did. They have like these set meals where you pay like 30 euros and you get um, a three-course meal. Ow! Someone just stabbed a life out of my leg. Whew. One of these wild plants. <laughs> but yeah, it's like 30 euros. You get like a three course uh, meal. And the first course of one of the meals was um, six escargot. And I seriously thought about it. I was like, if I was going to try it, like I wouldn't want it to be the meal. Because what if I hate it 
and then I'm still hungry and I've paid all this money for it but if I know there's like two other courses coming well then it's okay right <laughs> yeah so I almost did it but I changed my mind okay I'll give you a higher view there See our wild girl areas. And I think our rain has finally passed over. It might just be cloudy for a little bit. I'm still feeling kind of drops, but nothing heavy. And I hope this film is not like bouncing around too much the camera's not bouncing around too much hmm, interesting oh no that's not good well this is more online what I expect to see in like a minority cemetery except this whole thing would then be completely covered in grass and dirt and probably a tree or two that's fallen on it yeah, I'm a little cynical. I'm a little jaded. I admit it. It's okay. <laughs> it's also not wrong. Oh, what is this? Alright, before we go to the next part, I'm just going to stop this recording here. And then I'll start the next video. Okay. So just follow me. I noticed this as I turned around to start the next video. It's information about the tree. And I'm just, when you see me holding a camera like this, I'm just taking quick little pictures. Um, things I want to look at on my own later outside of viewing, you know, an hour and a half of <laughs> video recording. And I do apologize if the camera is bouncy at all. I'm trying to walk slow. I'm trying not to like fall into any holes or trip over anything. But, oh, that's creepy. Just wait till y'all see this. <laughs> but um, I forgot to bring like my little tripod thing for my camera. It helps make it a bit smoother. Maybe next time. But check this out. How creepy is that guy? Or lady. I don't know. Ugh. It's like looking into my soul. Wow. Huh. That is some amazing artistry. My, my, my. Really impressive. And I'm looking at this guy, I'm just like, I don't know what happened here. Did someone like try to break in? I don't know, that's weird. But this, oh, the wind. Again, I apologize, I know this wind is so strong. There's nothing I can do about it. This is what caught my eye from across the pathway colors in that stained glass are amazing. It's actually the stained glass in cemeteries in Paris that got me interested in stained glass. And now um, I've kind of taken it up as a hobby. I say that lightly because I haven't completed my first piece yet. Um, I bought everything I needed. I was going to do a project for my architecture class at school because we had to do one um, where we like did a replica of a building. And I picked like a museum in China by um, a famous Chinese architect and it's gonna do that and then um, my dad died right at finals wow. I'm sorry this is like hurricane wind over here <laughs> Anyway, 
anyway, my dad died during like finals week, right at finals week. Um, and so I never got my project finished. I had to get it incomplete in that class because like funeral stuff just was so overwhelming and took up so much time and school is very far you know if school was just 20 30 minutes away I probably could have gotten things done but my school is like an hour and a half on a good day <laughs> and so you know I just I couldn't do it it was too much so I did get the glass cut for that project but I never got it finished which I have to do sometime before December up on the higher level now. This is actually the road where I came in. Our bench has been through some things. <laughs> One thing I can say is that I do see machinery out here. It looks like somebody's trying to do some work. You know, I feel like these are some very targeted raindrops happening right now. I just got one in my eye a minute ago, and now one just smacked me in the mouth. I guess somebody's like, take a hint, Kelly. The raindrops are getting bigger. Go home. <laughs> can see the back wall here. So we've walked a lot of the cemeteries. It's not a huge cemetery. I will say that at this cemetery, um, noise, noise pollution is the thing. Outside of this ridiculous wind, <laughs> um, there is just traffic on all sides. Check this out. Well, I was just talking about this, right? The roots from the trees growing above ground. So Paris is not immune to this. <laughs> These roots are already into that vault under there. You can see here the damage they've done. Look at this. This is insane. Okay, let me zoom out, zoom out. Check that out. Can you see how that is tilted and leaning? See how the tree roots have gone into the ground underneath, uprooted, uprooted, and removed some of the concrete that was down there. They have messed this whole thing up. Look at that. They're headed down this pathway. Who knows how far they stretch? They've already butted up against this one, so they'll probably uproot this one. You know, these are not immediate things. This definitely happened over time. And you don't see it until you see it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> there's no damage until there's damage. And this, this is like massive. This whole thing is now off center. It is definitely in danger. And if this falls over, it's going to hit this one. Probably damaging this one. I don't guess this guy's going to move when that hits it. I don't know how heavy that is, though. It looks really heavy. It may or may not, you know, knock this one over a little bit, but I don't think that, I don't think this guy would hit that guy, so. But you've got some major damage happening just from this little guy here, <laughs> a very tall tree. Yeah, so. Trees are no-no, big, big no-no rain is definitely picking up. I might have to take my cue and head on out. I was heading back towards the entrance anyway. Um, I didn't get to see it all, but I saw a lot. This old lady I've seen, she's getting it, man. She's walked around me about six times while I've been out here.
Check out this one. This is unusual. It's open for plantings. That's kind of cool. I just love the integration of flowers and things right there at the end so that family can do what they like to do and plant stuff in memory of their people. This guy is tilting. He's in danger. You can already see the cracks coming in. Looks like they might have tried to do some repair. Yeah, they definitely tried. As I look back and really see it, they tried and failed. All right, rain is picking up, and these raindrops are big. They're smacking me. <laughs> well, we got to see a little bit. I have to do some research on this cemetery to find out, you know, what its roots are. I don't know anything about it. I took pictures of the paperwork at the entry, but they had a lot, so I didn't want to sit there trying to read through it all before doing this video. I'm definitely surprised at the amount of damage I see. But, again, I don't know the history of the cemetery. So that'll tell me a lot about this place once I read up on it and find out what's going on. to the Mont Rouge Cemetery. Very peaceful, very relaxing. I like it. I've had an opportunity to see some damage and reach into my memory. Think about what causes it and why and how it can be fixed. I haven't done much cemetery work outside of some volunteer things and some class stuff. So I'm kind of rusty. <laughs> oh, let's stop. Past a couple signs. They've got signs everywhere talking about all of the flower life out here. I think that is one way to go. You know, if you want to add to the value of your cemetery, and I know that sounds bad, right? But a lot of times people don't recognize the value of people buried at a cemetery if they aren't connected to those people. Sometimes even if it's famous people, they just, they're very disconnected. And they're like, why does this place matter? And so ways to increase that value are like what you see happening here, you know. Educational value and learning about the different types of flowers out here. Um, there's probably educational value to people who study insects too, I don't know. Um, but they also just have an ecological value as they allow a place for bees and other insects to grow and to encourage plant life. That's amazing. It actually makes me wonder if there's a way to combine, that probably sounds awful now that I'm saying it, but if there's a way to combine like cemeteries with community farming. I don't know. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. How safe is it to eat something that's grown out here? I mean, these things are planted far away from the burials. So, things. I don't 
a look at the year on the other one. They're the same year. Maybe that's something that was common at that period in time. I don't know. Oh, it is like full raining on me. <laughs> Y'all are welcome for me going out facing the horrible storm, the hurricane force like winds, the flood like rains. So you should like and subscribe. <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> I do this for you because I love you, whoever you are. <laughs> definitely not me trying to get shameless likes and subscribes. Not at all. The color of these things. Oh my gosh. So, so pretty. Makes me wish my daughter was with me because she loves taking pictures of cool flowers. Alright. Safe from the rain for a bit. We are back up at the main gates and exiting gonna show y'all real quick these massive gates to this space like you're not getting through that <laughs> and now I'm noticing they have plantings all along the outside of the building as well look at that so it's pretty cool so anyway thank you for joining me on my journey of this place and I will see you next time bye